Good afternoon. Uh, I thank Benedetto and the organizers for having invited me for this uh, extraordinary meeting. Extraordinary because it's not just mental health, it's a combination of very many aspects of life which are so useful to us. I wish I could speak in Italian, but I don't even speak the 20 Indian languages. So it's, it'll take me a long while to really uh, learn to speak Italian. But I'll speak slowly so that the translators who are doing an excellent job can follow what I'm saying. I was asked to talk about innovative programs and I will be highlighting one or two of them, not all of them that we do. Uh, it's largely to reach the untreated persons with mental illness using the innovative programs. For those of you who may not know where India is, that's where it is. And we live in the southern part of India, which is very close to Sri Lanka, as you can see. And we have a lovely beach in the city of Chennai. And these are the various districts of uh, the state, which is called Tamil Nadu. As you can see, the city of Chennai alone, the population is 6 million. I don't know what the population in Milan is. Okay, so uh, we really deal with a huge population. And of course, we don't work in the city alone. We move out into the villages, and that is where we do a lot of work as well. You know the population of India is 1.2 billion. We are the second largest populated country in the world. One in six people you meet would be an Indian. I mean, uh, theoretically speaking. So we have seven to eight million Indians with serious mental disorder and over 20 million in need of mental health inputs which includes minor mental disturbances like depressions, anxiety, and so on. We have only 4,000 psychiatrists. There are more Indian psychiatrists outside India than within India. I think the number of Indian psychiatrists in the United States is equal to the number of Indian psychiatrists in India. So we have a huge brain drain. And of course, we have fewer psychologists and fewer social workers. We practically don't have psychiatric nurses. Again, the nurses are in the Middle East or they are in America. Uh, so we have very few left with us. And uh, we have about 20,000 hospital beds and 50% of them are occupied by long stay patients. We have a number of untreated patients, especially in the villages, in the rural areas. And traditional and faith healing is very, very widely prevalent. I will be talking more about it because it will interest some of you. And a, a very small percentage of the health budget is spent on mental health. First of all, the health budget itself is very low. And about 2% of the health budget is spent on mental health. And we have no disability benefits. I was just talking to some people about how in Italy and Germany, the mentally ill have good disability benefits but we do not have them in India. It is with great difficulty that we lobbied and included the mentally ill among the disabled, but we still, they still do not have any disability benefits except maybe some bus fare. That's all they have. Therefore, the entire burden is borne by the families, you know, who have to pay for the treatment, who have to look after the mentally ill person. Now, I'll have to tell you about this. This is an incident which happened in 2001. Uh, I was telling you about religious treatment. In India, there are some temples and there are some mosques where the particular, and they are supposed to be specialized centers in treating the mentally ill. Just like you have human doctor specialists, there are temples and mosques and churches which are also specialized. So, in one such mosque, in my own state of Tamil Nadu in 2001, people were chained in a hut. They had come there for treatment. They were chained because 
They, they didn't want, did not want them to escape. And there was a fire in the hut overnight. These people could not run away and they all died. So we lost 25 people because of that. And this was such a national shame. So after that, a lot of uh, programs started to fall in place. So the government ordered that all these unauthorized places, that is in the temples or in the mosques, all of them should be closed. But instead of saying, the funny thing is, instead of saying start more community-based programs, they said start more mental hospitals. But fortunately, we have not started the mental hospitals. We do have a lot more of community-based programs, although it is still not as good as what we would like it to be. The other national shame is that we don't have a mental health policy. We have a mental health program, which is called the National Mental Health Program, which is not again as good as it ought to be, but we really don't have a mental health policy. So what really happens is in each state, people do what they want to do or what they think they can do. There are government hospitals, there are NGOs, there are a lot of private practitioners. Now, I told you about the National Mental Health Program. Basically, this looked at the integration of mental health in primary care. Because as I told you, there are only 4,000 psychiatrists. They can't do all the work. So, so they said, let us train the primary care doctors in delivery of mental health. But this, again, is not happening as well as it ought to happen. Because the funds were meager, there was not proper supervision, there was lack of trained manpower, there were no psychiatrists in many districts. The GPs, that is the general practitioners, the doctors, were not willing to treat with psychiatric medication. They said, listen, we have too many things, we have tuberculosis, we have malaria, we have uh, all other infectious disorders, we are not going to be doing mental health. So they, they still have that very uh, uh, biased attitude towards mental disorders. And there was still a preference for religious and traditional healing in many rural areas. Therefore, the National Mental Health Program, although it is very nice on paper, has not really caught on. This is the city of Chennai. This is one of the temples that we have. Temple, as you may know, is where the Hindus worship. And 80% of India is Hindu. The rest are Muslims and Christians. Now, Chennai city has a population of 6 million. What I want you to understand is it's a very upcoming modern city in many ways. You have IT-related industries. You have automobile industries. Name the industry, your Mercedes, all the Korean companies, the Japanese companies, all of them have their factories in Chennai. And we have the best of medical institutions. But on the other hand, we also have a lot of urban slums, as you can see here a huge population, we are not able to control the population, and we had what is called, we spoke about migration, uh, we have been talking about migration periodically, we had the Sri Lankan Tamil issue, uh, I told you Sri Lanka is just below our state, some of you might know the huge ethnic problems that Sri Lanka had, and because part of Sri Lanka were Tamils, and we are also Tamils, they migrated into Chennai. So we had a lot of problem with migration. And one of the problems which I think has not been hitherto mentioned is the problem with drugs and alcohol. The Sri Lankans brought with them a huge lot of drugs, marijuana, hashish, everything. And they were taking it to Europe and to America through India. So, uh, and they were also distributing it very generously to all our students. So we did have a huge drug problem because of the Sri Lankan migration. Luckily, things are improving a bit, and it is not uh, as bad as it was like 10 years ago. Now, we have one large mental hospital. Somebody is talking of 200 beds. We have 1,800 beds, uh, and that is actually a downsized figure. We had about 2,500 beds, and that has now been downsized to about 1,800 beds. 
and all efforts in downsizing it further are uh, not very successful. And we have just about 43 psychiatrists in government service. There are more in private practice. There are not enough community-based facilities at all. There are a few NGOs in the area of mental health. And there are a large number of persons with severe mental disorders who remain untreated. And why are they remaining untreated? Because of poor awareness about mental health, Many of them were from the slums, they were daily wage earners. See, if they have to bring a patient to the hospital one day, it means somebody has to accompany them and that man loses his income for that day. So even that they were not able to afford and therefore they were not bringing the patient to the hospital. Many of them lived in joint families so they were able to kind of handle the patient well and there was of course social stigma in seeking treatment. Well, we therefore founded SCARF in 1984. It's a WHO collaborating center for mental health research and training. We also are the center for PhD studies. And uh, the good thing about SCARF is we are trying to strike a balance between delivering community-based services on one hand and doing fairly international high-class research on the other. We are trying to strike that balance, which is rather difficult for a non-profit organization. So these are all the uh, services we offer, outpatient service, we have a daycare program, family empowerment program, rehabilitation, residential care, community outreach clinics, telepsychiatry, I'll come to it later, research training. I also want to tell you that 98% of patients with mental illness in India live with families. Unlike what you will find here or elsewhere, Therefore, we really have to do a lot of work with families. We decided to start the community-based mental health program in 1990, especially after the Airwadi tragedy. I told you after these people were uh, charred to death. And these are the basic components of the uh, program. One is we establish liaison with other organizations, with other NGOs. We do a lot of training to the people in the primary care facilities. We, do, we run community clinics and we do a lot of awareness programs. 